Hi, this is Ahmed Alogaili and Manos Berlakis presenting case 161 for the Manual of PCI. This is a case illustrating some of the challenges associated with uh, the need for hemodynamic support in patients who have significant peripheral arterial disease as well as those who have uh, severe coronary disease and low ejection fraction. The patient was an elderly gentleman that presented with uh, progressive dyspnea. He was found to have an honesty elevation myocardial infarction and a compensated heart failure. And then he was found to have an ejection fraction of 10 to 15% with low output, low gradient aortic stenosis, critical left main disease with a CTO of the right, and he was turned down by cardiac surgery because the concern was that he would not be able to come off pump given the low ejection fraction and the critical coronary disease. This is his echo showing significant global hypokinesis. And this is the aortic valve. Again, low output, low gradient aortic stenosis. There's some movement on the aortic valve. And this is a coronary angiography. There is a severe distal left main disease, 90% stenosis. There's some calcification. There are previously placed stents in the LAD that appear to be okay with diffuse distal disease. There's also significant calcification. In the right coronary artery, in the previous stents, the RCA is a CTO. So EF of 10 to 15%, aortic stenosis, 90% left main, and CTO of the right coronary artery. And these are the numbers from the right heart catheterization, showing an OK RA pressure of 11, but uh, the wedge was slightly up at uh, 24 millimeters mercury, cardiac index of 1.88. So given the low ejection fraction and the severity of coronary disease, and especially the RCA CTO, as well as the aortic stenosis, we decided to use hemodynamic support. However, the patient had severe peripheral arterial disease. This is a CTA that had been done recently, showing significant calcification in the aortoiliac vessels with significant disease, both in the iliacs as well as the femoral arteries. So we decided to use an impeller device and use it through axillary access. So we obtained biradial arterial access and did an angiogram. And actually, there was a significant osteal stenosis in the left subclavian. So that was not an optimal access point for the impeller. But uh, the right subclavian and axillary artery was actually okay. So we decided to use that for insertion of the impeller device. Access was obtained in the third segment of the axillary artery. This is the patient angiogram. This is the circumflex humeral artery and the thoracoacromial artery. So the ideal place is to get the access in the third segment. We want to be definitely outside the rib cage so that we can compress the artery if we need to. And if there's a complication, there's no stand coming through the ribs. And also we want to go fairly shallow in obtaining access in order to uh, facilitate insertion of equipment in the subclavian artery. There are several nerves coursing along the axillary artery, so there's always a small risk of nerve injury during percutaneous access. So here is an angiogram again. This is obtained by having a diagnostic catheter, a JR4, inserted through the right radial axis. And here we can see that our needle is entering uh, distal or outside the rib cage. And we were able to insert the impella sheath, and then uh, we had some difficulty crossing the aortic valve given the aortic stenosis. So we ended up using an AL1 diagnostic catheter with a straight tip guide wire that successfully entered into the ventricle. The impella was inserted. Again, we did not have much difficulty, not much tortuosity on the right subclavian, and then uh, support was initiated with uh, about 3.6 uh, liters per minute. We tried to advance a seven-friend guide from the left radial artery to engage the left main, but we could not get through the proximal left subclavian stenosis, so we used a single access technique from the impeller sheath and inserted a seven-friend EBU375 guide. In terms of strategy, um, we do have uh, a significant distal left main lesion. There was some disease in the ostium of the LAD, some diffuse disease in the circumflex. 
But in terms of technique, we decided to start with a provisional strategy, but having a wire in the circumflex for protection. So we dilated, and to our pleasant surprise, there was good expansion of a balloon. We did not intravascular ultrasound, that saw calcification, but there was a fracture in the calcification. And then we ended up standing with a 3.5 millimeter um, drag eluting stand, again, jailing the circumflex, and then did the proximal optimization with a 4 by 8 millimeter balloon. And this was the angiographic result. There is good flow into the circumflex. There is uh, some disease in the ostium, which can be challenging to assess given the calcification. We actually attempted to insert a pressure wire, but we were unable to advance a pressure wire into the circumflex. So we decided to accept the result, and uh, the patient was very stable, although when we were inflating balloons in the left main, the pressure line was flat. And then we decided to remove the impella sheath, so we inserted a initially 7 and then 8 millimeter by 40 balloon from the radial axis, and we were able to remove the sheath, tighten up the two percloses that we had placed when obtaining access, and um, we did have a good hemostasis. In the end, this is actually an injection happening from femoral axis. We had some difficulties with the closure, so we obtained femoral axis, but there was no bleeding. The patient did actually well and had an eventful recovery. So there are several lessons from this case. The first one is that when there's absolute need for hemodynamic support in a patient like this with very low ejection fraction, CT of the right, severe left main disease, then using support is important, but finding the access point can be challenging. Femoral insertion was not an option in this patient. The left axillary was not optimal because of the subclavian stenosis, so we decided to use right axillary, which was successful in allowing delivering of the impella. An alternative option would have been to do transcaval axis. In terms of um, getting the guide to the left main, again, the left um, was not uh, optimal. We could not get the guide through the subclavian, and we ended up using the single axis technique through the impella sheath, successfully engaged uh, the left main using the right axillary axis. In terms of PCI strategy, we did have a significant distal left main disease. We wired both the circumflex and the LAD, predilated, showing good expansion, and then did uh, a provisional strategy with a single stand from the left main into the LAD. That actually provided a good result. It was not perfect in the circumflex, but T3 flow, and given the overall scenario and the patient's high risk, we ended up not performing any additional optimization. And finally, for complex cases like this, having a detailed discussion with the heart team, with the patient, with the surgeons, is very important to making the best potential plan and uh, having everyone on board in achieving the best revascularization for this patient. Thank you.